Are you concerned about separation anxiety developing in your Boston Terrier? In this video, we're going to cover five things that you can do to help avoid it. Coming up. Hey everybody, welcome to the Boston Terrier Society YouTube channel. Be sure to hit subscribe if you're someone who wants to learn more about the breed, learn what it's like to be an owner, hear expert interviews like the one today, or connect with other Boston Terrier lovers just like yourself. I'm Donnie Gardner, the founder of bostonterriersociety.com, and today we're gonna to be covering the topic of separation anxiety. It's really a big one, especially since the pandemic, because separation anxiety can actually develop whenever we're gonna be around our puppies or dogs for a long period of time, and then all of a sudden we're back to work and that's when the separation anxiety can pop up. But today, I have Sarah Hodgson's with us. She's the author of multiple books. Some of them include Puppies for Dummies, as well as Modern Dog Parenting. She's been a lover of animals since she was a kid. She does training, both virtual and in person. So if you're wanting to learn how to avoid separation anxiety in your Boston Terrier, she's gonna break down what it is and the five steps that you can follow to help avoid it. If you wanna look at each of those five steps individually, go to the show notes because I have timestamps there so you can go to which one you wanna check out just for your convenience. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Sarah, thanks for coming on today. Well, I wanna go ahead and jump into separation anxiety and just specifically with Boston Terriers before we talk about any particular methods. Do you know, is separation anxiety a known trait within a Boston Terrier breed? Is it breed specific or do you just see this in general among all dogs? You know, it's such an interesting question because there's a dramatic uptick in what everybody is calling separation anxiety. Now, there is a difference, and I will, I will talk to the Boston Terrier particularly, but there is a big difference between separation anxiety and isolation distress. Separation anxiety is an actual panic disorder. It is heartbreaking to see, and I have some really good tips to help your viewers if they um, feel their dog is suffering or they know their dog is suffering and they're looking for maybe a fresh approach to mm -hmm. how to cope with the problem. Isolation distress isn't so much as a panic disorder as the dogs will get anxious when completely left alone. Mm -hmm. Separation anxiety usually focuses on one attachment, one really strong attachment to an individual, whereas isolation yeah. distress only occurs when the dog is completely left alone. So your viewers can, can take my quiz. I have a separation anxiety versus isolation distress quiz on my website. I'll put that in show notes. Excellent. They can take that quiz, but um, isolation distress, those dogs can be comforted by the presence of another human. You could even get a babysitter for your dog that's mm -hmm. suffering isolation distress. But if my dog has separation anxiety, and I have a babysitter here, it won't matter. The bond okay. between, the, between me and my dog is so strong that they'll still have a, have a reaction to my departing. Mm -hmm. Now, so to the, to the question of Boston Terriers, they did a study where they asked um, 100, 150 Boston Terriers, um, and from that they determined that 64% of Boston Terriers do suffer separation anxiety. They are a breed that bonds very tightly to their owners. They're very engaged with their owners. So, you know, they're not like an independent breed, like a terrier who's happy to chew a bone and, you know, take a pat when they can get one. Boston Terriers want to be completely surrounded by love and the people they love, and they want to feel that connection. So, during the pandemic, there's this crazy uptick and people are like, why during a pandemic, we're here all the time. Like right. you think that would cure the separation anxiety, uh -huh. but it doesn't. And it doesn't because dogs don't have the rhythmic um, daily uh, patterns that dovetail into their natural um, biorhythm. So with dogs, they are crepuscular. They are most awake pre like dawn like till 9 a.m and then they sleep they rest during the day and That's then they're right awake exactly mm -hmm. and they're most awake at four o'clock so what's happened with the pandemic instead of having those periods of quiet mm -hmm. where they can replenish they can rest they can nap 
Dogs need 75% rest during the day. It's like it's a chronic house party and their naps are constantly interrupted. And we take them for walks whenever we want. And we, we get up and we go to the bathroom or we get into an interchange with the kids over home, the schooling, or we get on a Zoom call. So the dogs aren't having that daily pattern of interact, rest, interact, bed. Interact, rest, interact, bed. Instead of it's wake up, interact, 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 and it stresses them out because they, they need the rest. And so what you're doing beautifully with Bella is, you know, you're, you're, because you're young parents, you're, you have a full-time job within your house <laughs> right. all the time. So you really don't have the time to engage her during the day because you're focused on the kids. And that's actually a uh, life-saving for you. Huh, interesting. Because, I never thought of that. Right. If you didn't have the kids and she was your only kid, you'd be like, Bella, you want to walk? Bella, you want to come over, sit on the couch? Bella, let's watch TV. Bella, you want to snack? And all day long, you'd be shaking up her snow globe. And so that is what's creating separation anxiety. It's lowering the bar of stress because they're kind of always on edge. Who's going to walk in? And With separation anxiety, what are some things that you could look out for and be like, you know, I think my dog has separation anxiety. Yeah. Are there signs? And whether it's separation anxiety or isolation distress, because isolation distress on um, unresolved will lead to separation anxiety. It can lead to separation anxiety. It can okay. be like a flip. Whether or not you think your dog has some something going on. Mm -hmm. One way you can tell is that if you stand up, they stand up. They're so okay. attuned to your motion. If you go in the bathroom, they want to be with you. If you go out and get the mail, it's as though you've been gone a year. That dog is not able to self-soothe. They need your presence to reassure them. Does that's that make really, sense? That's really interesting because whenever we lived at our old apartment, Bella would follow us everywhere. Like we, if I went to take a shower, she was in the shower. If I went to the bathroom, she was in the bathroom. And at that point, whenever we moved to our new house, you know, this is me self-diagnosing. I'm like, she's got separation anxiety. We had her in a metal cage because we were just trying to create a trainer, and that's Ray Kepper. And we started finding teeth outside. But I never even thought that, well, kind of making a long story, but she lost some of her teeth. Then all of a sudden, she stopped following us to the bathroom whenever we took her out of that crate and everything. And I just thought it was you know, that's weird that she never comes to the bathroom anymore whenever we're taking a shower or anything like that. You but taught her how to self-soothe. Okay, without trying to teach her. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. But the key thing is, and, and it's one of the first, I have a five point uh, tips on separation anxiety. I have a blog and I'm happy to share that with your viewers or just a readout of these five tips. But one of the first ones is don't be a house elf. Just because, because dogs, when they come into our lives, mm -hmm. identify us as either parents or playmates. Mm -hmm. They love both equally, but if they perceive you as a playmate, as they mature, you will become their house elf. They will be constantly prompting you to engage. And the problem with that is when you leave, mm -hmm. they implode because... Mm -hmm. They'll either be distressed because they can't get to you, or they'll they'll feel this this separation anxiety, which is they feel trapped, alone, and as though death is soon to overcome them, that you'll never come back. So it's very important to think of the crate not like a metal cage that you're leaving your animal in, because that would depress anybody. It would depress me. But you think of the crate similar to a crib. Okay. to a crib and what you're teaching the dogs is that hey we're your parents we know that you need to rest between nine and four and if you don't rest between nine and four then you're going to act like an over tired toddler right teeth yeah. and then the problem with that they become so chronically overtired that they can't self-soothe. And then you have a problem instead of starting with a solution. Could you give us just some tips on 
how to go about this yourself if you're wanting to self-soothe your dog to try to get them away from that separation, isolation, or anxiety? The first is uh, organize the schedule. Dogs, again, dogs are crepuscular. You need to teach them to self-soothe, yes, but you also need to teach them to rest. And so were I to show you my dogs, now they're here, they rest during the day. I know, right? I've got one at my foot, one there, one there. And they know that, there's Bella. They, yeah, there's Bella, here's, they, we call him T-Bill the walrus because he really only, we live on a lake, he really only moves in the water. Uh, <laughs> otherwise he just lays around. Um, so uh, rest is so important. So much separation anxiety is overtired. They're overtired and they're frantically just running around, you know, the same merry, the same vicious cycle in their head. And they haven't learned how to breathe, how to calm themselves down and how to rest and trust life. They're always worried. They're always thinking about where are you? And oh my God, I'm gonna be left alone. And it just, the, the monkeys in their brain are making them crazy. With a dog, their natural biorhythm is to be up in the morning, up in the later afternoon and sleep during the day. So you're gonna mirror that here. You're going to get up before nine or 10. You know, I always say between 7.30 and 8.30 is ideal. Not everybody's a morning person, but somewhere before that 10 o'clock mark, take your dogs out for 20 minutes, play with them, take them for a walk to organize their schedule, exercise in the morning, then create a happy place. I have videos on my YouTube channel of how to create a happy place for your dog. And it's either a crate, but with dogs that already have developed isolation anxiety or isolation distress or separation anxiety, they can go crazy in a crate. It's not healthy to crate them because they will be frantic. And if that's your dog, don't do it just because everything says crate your dog. You can create a happy place. Um, I have a happy place as I show in my video. That's just a section of my kitchen where I block in a little section. Mm -hmm. It's you know four feet by two feet. And initially go into the happy place with your dog. You can work on your computer there. You can um, be there with your dog and try to organize naps that are an hour and a half to three hours long where you're not you're not paying any attention to your dog. You've got, you can throw down sweatshirts and self-soothing toys like bones and the licky mat I showed earlier and go in there, do your work, be present, but not accessible. After okay. an hour and a half, you can take them outside, take them outside, let them go potty, interact calmly. Very little attention between say nine and four, minimal. Okay. You can give them breaks just because with, three to five seconds of attention. So mm -hmm. they don't feel completely like upended, right? But yeah. create that happy place. Then the, the hub, the main hub of your attention comes before nine and after four. Okay. And then in the middle of the day, it's low key. Mm -hmm. No attention for, for what, the, what is anxiety driven behavior, the scratching at you, the pawing at you, mm -hmm. the whining or barking at you. I teach what I call the peekaboo solution. So if your dog's frantic, having anxiety, you know, dogs with separation anxiety can have spikes of anxiety even when you're present and they can't get your attention. So even when you're sitting, focusing on, let's say a Zoom call or you're watching TV or you're doing something with the kids, they can feel anxiety just because in the moment they can't get you to plug in. So it's important when your dog has an anxiety ridden, uh, an anxiety driven behavior, whining, barking, pawing, saying, do you love me? Do you love me? It's been 30 seconds. Do you still love me? Do you still love me? Mm -hmm. Very calmly, you cover your face and you count huh. to three or you uh -huh. wait until your dog has stopped because what you want to be doing is teaching the dog that when you feel anxious, I'll disappear. Mm -hmm. And your appearance, just like with the toddler, is all about the eyes. If they okay. can't see your eyes, you're gone. You don't have to walk out of the room. You don't have to yell at your dog. You don't have to shake hands. Please don't shake hands with pennies in them. You, I mean, all those are so anxiety causing. They cause me anxiety. Just come. Yeah.
teach your dog that if you have a dog with severe separation anxiety and they lie down and chew a bone, you can very calmly just pet them just for a couple of seconds. You can take a treat. This is a treat cup. It's a washed out gum container. You can take a treat and reward self-soothing behaviors in the dog, but don't- Positive reinforcements. Yeah, don't reinforce. And again, don't do anything theatrical. You're on the park bench, they're on the roller coaster. Just cover your face. Let them know if you do that, I will disappear. Mm -hmm. And then they will, they'll put it together. It may take a day, a week, who knows, depends how old your dog is and how mm -hmm. much you've reinforced the anxiety behavior, but mm -hmm. it works. Um, okay, I said before, don't be a house elf. This is very important. So with a dog with separation anxiety, they can't shut off their brain. They can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. And so they get locked into this, do you love me? Do you love me? Are you still with me? Are you with me? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? And then you inadvertently reinforce anxiety-driven behavior, like ringing the bell to go out, like mm -hmm. nudging you, like jumping up at you for attention. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, like barking at a cabinet to get treats. Okay, yeah. all of these, if you hop up and respond mm -hmm. to your dog in the moment, you are their house self. You are reinforcing that you are here to serve them. And then when you leave, their world comes yeah. to an end. So like, don't play the house self. Again, if my dog um, is, I don't know, pawing at a bell or doing something, I, I'll either just cover my face with whatever I'm doing, my hands, a magazine, a book. I'll calmly walk away from the dog. So they're ring. I know they don't have to go out, they were just out. They're ringing it to get me to stop being on the Zoom call. I will calmly walk out of the room. I won't reinforce the behavior by paying attention to it. Hey, I hope you're getting value out of this. Consider subscribing to this YouTube channel if you want to get the latest. Otherwise, back to the show. Um, Sarah, can you share with us two more tips about you know how to deal with separation anxiety? <laughs> you, you keep track of your tips well. I mentioned three. Create a schedule. Don't be the house elf and um, the peekaboo solution. The next one builds on those in that I want you, uh, I want everybody, this is important whether your dog has anxiety or not. It's mm -hmm. such a good foolproof to prevent anxiety is teach your dog or puppy as young as eight weeks to say please. And you do this by teaching them that they have to sit and be breathing normally before you'll give them whatever they want. So when I'm feeding a puppy, yeah, I'll hold the bowl up. If they jump or squirm or whine, it goes up or back on the counter, I cover my face. Mm -hmm. Then when they sit and are breathing normally, not just a crazy puppy sit where they sit and jump up and sit and jump up. They sit and they're breathing, then they get their food. I don't say a word. I let them figure it out. Now, the other thing is I teach them uh, what I call the ABCs, the sit down stand so that the puppy does start to learn the word sit. And then if the puppy comes and jumps on me, uh, I'll ignore them. When they get down, if they're not sure what to do, I'll prompt them with a sit, and then I'll immediately give them attention or maybe a treat from my pocket or from a tree cup. Um, if they want attention, they have to sit. If they want to be picked up, they have to sit. And as they get older, they have to sit for gradually increasing periods of time. And then I'll give them what they want. So they learn impulse control, they learn self-control, and they learn patience. All by just teaching them that the value of sitting and waiting until I can address you. Mm -hmm. I, I do teach my dogs this thing, which is not now. I can't do uh -huh. it. But when they're little, everything, if you have a toy, I hold it out for my puppy and they jump or get excited, the toy goes up. It goes further away, it goes out of reach. When they sit, I'll give it a toss or I'll give it to them. Um, and that's the same with treats. I use treat cups all day long when they're little. I put their food in the treat cup. I shake the cup, they hear it. When they get to me, I say come. So they learn come means we're together. If they jump for the treat, I lift it up. When they're not jumping, I drop the treat and say find it. Do you know why, Donnie? This is something most people don't know. 
First of all, the reason why, when they're little, especially, but even if they're older, I play the find it game. You, you probably have introduced your viewers to this, but I have yeah. uh, oh, it's great. I have a video online, Katie will share it. Mm -hmm. So find it, you drop a treat for a couple of reasons. Number one, you teach a puppy not to jump by having them always waiting on the floor for you to drop their things. Okay. If they grab it out of your hand, they start to jump, right? Because they want to grab it. Mm -hmm. So you teach a puppy, no, if you jump up to grab, it'll disappear. When you hold still, it'll drop. Mm -hmm. Number two, this fascinates people. Mm -hmm. Dogs' breathing tube and eating tubes are almost just Siamese twins. Uh -huh. And dogs physiologically are bred to eat with their head facing down. Mm -hmm. This is why, especially with brachiocephalic, this is why it's important not to feed with their necks arched up because when you feed this way, it often goes down their breathing tube and then they cough. Interesting. And they that. Right. So it's another reason why I love to just drop treats for dogs. Um, the third reason, and this is important, is because when dogs, when you're training like a dog in the world beyond, like your home is their den, the yard, the territory. When you take them out in the world beyond, one of the key first things you need to teach them not to do is stare. Don't stare at a car, don't stare at a dog, don't stare at a squirrel, don't stare at a person. Because staring leads to predatory behavior or hyper-excited behavior. And when your dog stares, if you just have a word, you call them back with their name, I usually use. So I'd say like, Bella, Bella. And then I'll say, find it. Uh -huh. Then I can break her if she's like a puppy and she's particularly focused on skateboarders. Every time I even see a skateboarder or I'll rig up a skateboarder coming by, I'll mm -hmm. start shaking the cup saying, Bella, Bella, find it. It breaks the eye contact. I can uh -huh. redirect her away from the skateboarder. And then she learns to process. I see a skateboard, I look at dad. Rather, I see a skateboard, I lunge, and dad yells and is mm -hmm. dragging behind me. You follow. So yeah. that's a great skill. So we teach, so the fourth tip is to teach them to say, please sit for everything they want. Toys, attention, food, treats. Use your treats. I do that already with Bella about 51% of the time. <laughs> All right, I want it up by the next yeah. time I talk to you, Donnie. Right. 90% 90, 90 of the time is your goal. Because even 100, because sitting becomes the new jump. Right. Mm -hmm. So if a dog learns I can jump and get what I want, then they become Olympic jumpers. They become chronic jumpers. But if you teach a young puppy, I won't let you out of your crate. I won't let you out of the gate. I won't come in the gate. I won't give you your food unless you're sitting. Boom, boom, boom. They sit for everything. It's phenomenal. Yeah. And they don't care. They'll jump. They'll sit. Just format it with giving them what they want. And then yeah. they're all happy. Well, we were training Bella to do some tricks. And we were using treats where she would sit and roll over but she got to the point where we would just be sitting watching tv and bella would sit and roll over we're like easy cowgirl no we're not I'm just gonna give you so she would i mean she would do it like six times in a row like, yeah i get one tree so smart. <laughs> she's smart. that's why you need the not now mm -hmm. we're present okay. not now and then if she keeps it up you just block your face mm -hmm. and then but then donnie you have to redirect her you have to not only say not now you have to say, get your bone, give her a high value bone. Mm -hmm. And then, so not now, show her what to do instead. And mm -hmm. then if she keeps it up, just block your face. And then when she takes her bone, you tell her she's a good girl and better. Number five, are you ready for number five? Oh, yes, ready for tip number five. It's the best, it's a buildup, right? All of this is a buildup for number five. You have to rework, reorganize, tweak, uh, upend the departures and arrivals. For example, most dogs with isolation, distress, or separation anxiety notice the first signal you're heading out the door, whether that's putting on lipstick, blow drying your hair, grabbing a purse, grabbing keys. So you're gonna now pair those activities with food and fun throughout the day. For example, grab your keys, grab a tree cup, go in the backyard, and with your keys jangling in one hand, play, find it with the other. Mm -hmm. You are going to have your purse filled with dog toys. 
and uh. self soothing toys and hollow bone stuff with peanut butter. So you carry your purse around and you call Bill over and you go, what have I got? What have I got? So that there's no direct link between, um, uh, you know, one activity and the next. Um, and so write all their triggers down. They get upset when I pull my shoes on. Then start putting your shoes on throughout the day when they're awake, not when they're sleeping before dawn or after, you know, at the beginning or the end of the day. Pull on your boots, feed them their food by hand, playing find it. Um, that's so important because I can sense when my body physiologically is getting stressed and it builds from just an echo to like, a wave to a tsunami with these poor dogs. So as soon as they start feeling anxious, they get whirled up and by the time you leave, they're, they're often already in a state. Use food and fun. Don't use any fear and frustration to motivate your relationship or their behavior. So food and fun with all the little triggers that get them going. You look at your arrivals. How do you arrive? So here's the thing, most dogs, if the arrivals are stoked, if they're either framed with frustration because you come in and the dog's peed or destroyed a mm -hmm. piece of furniture or whatever, or they're so laden with guilt. Oh my God, the guilt. So if you come in and your dog's in an anxious state for whatever reason, mm -hmm. and you focus on that anxious state, mm -hmm. what happens is anytime maybe a car drives by the same model as your car or a delivery gets, you know, the mailman comes or a package gets delivered. Anytime your dog thinks it might be you, they're getting whirled up into that anxious state. Again, reinforcing the, the implosion. So when you come in, your arrivals, whether you're just coming out from, from the kitchen because you went and got a snack or mm -hmm. you're coming in from getting the mail, totally ignore your dog. Don't, mm -hmm. I do not acknowledge you when you're anxious. You have to either displace on a self-soothing thing because you're anxious and you need to chew a high value bone or lick a thing or i just come in and i ignore you i show you how to model the calm arrival departure continuum mm -hmm. i'm just going to come in put everything down maybe have a snack as long as it takes for your dog to be breathing normally to reconnect in a calm fashion if you have to take them out take them out just don't make any eye contact no physical interaction in, until they're either focusing on one of their displacement toys mm -hmm. or they've, they've settled down. And then when you do connect, it's not laden with emotion. It's just this, what I call, I have a video on this, by the way, the self-soothing effects of mother tongue. Their mother <laughs> used to lick them, right, to calm them down. That's how you should be calming your dog if they've uh, been in an anxiety triggering scenario or situation and again it could be just you're going to the loo you come out right. dog's just like wait a minute it's been 10 uh -huh. seconds do you love me do you love me yeah it's more, just breathe model calmness and remember any discipline is like just worst thing possible because then you when you leave they know you're not going to come back monster version of daddy or mommy's coming back and they're so nervous of that that monster. Especially with back. Boston Terriers, like they're Bella, so sensitive. He's already. She, I mean, you already know she did something because she looks super guilty, and she's already super like shaking and everything. <laughs> you would look yeah, at her and think, because the dogs don't really know. They know that um, when you come in and there's um, like tissue on the ground torn up that you'll be mad or disappointed, even disappointment with the Boston Terriers, they take oh, yeah. it hard. Remember, these are dogs, they are so loving, they are so giving, but they don't understand human psychology, and they don't do things out of spite, and they don't, they can't parallel my anxiety that led me to grab that tissue that I tore up five minutes, an hour, two hours ago, I shouldn't have done that. They, they're, again, they're so simple. They're animals. They're, there are babies. There are infants. You wouldn't get mad if your infant tore up a tissue. It's the same with dogs, and especially with Bostons, they would, they would give you their heart and soul. But if you get mad at them, then they just are a nervous wreck all the time, and it's so sad. Yeah. Like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, all the tips that you said, those are great, 
And it's funny, like looking in hindsight, you know, when Emily and I, because this was probably over a two year process as far as, you know, Bella's separation anxiety that she had, because like what you'd say, whenever we would do a trigger, it didn't matter. I don't like recall me saying, oh, those are triggers. She would just be by the door, basically trying to block us from leaving. Right. Anytime we'd go somewhere. As far as, you know, the safe place that you mentioned, we created that, that kind of inadvertently because we were doing crate and then we made the bathroom, you know, the safe place, but we didn't realize it. But that's right. where her bed was. We would put a pad in, a puppy pad in there and she was at least felt comforted. And over the course of, I don't know how many months, she just doesn't get anxious anymore. Right. Um, as far, and I think training definitely helps and we didn't do any formal training. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit, because you do online virtual dog training now. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your programs? Absolutely. So the pandemic hit and I went to exclusively virtual. Both <laughs> right, everybody. Both, like right away. And what was amazing, Donnie, is it's so much more effective. Because when I, I have an aura, you, I'm sure you've seen dog people. I've always had it. It's just been my thing with animals and it's God given. I'm like, I didn't think about it. But when I come in, I know how to use my body to communicate to calm dogs. And um, the people would be just speechless that their dog that was just behaving so badly is now behaving beautifully. And I'd give them tips, but they'd be so busy watching me handling mm -hmm. their dog that when I left, they wouldn't remember a thing. And then I'd have to come a week after week after week. And even though I would tell them, I'm training you, you have to do this. And I'd leave them with, you know, handouts and eBooks. Yeah. It wasn't effective. But now with virtual, it's like, I am literally training you. I can't get near your dog. So I now watch people on a Zoom call and I'll be like, that was good. Try it again without looking at your dog. And then they have to do it. And then they see wow, that did work better. Or they'll hold the freak up and they'll run away from their dog and saying, come, and the dog won't come. And then I'll say, well, you have to shake the tree cup because the dog understands it's the sound of the tree cup. And then they'll pair the sound with the word come. Right. And then they get the aha moment. But, but I'm like on virtual, so I'm modifying their behavior and I'm not having any relationship with their dog. So right. they're developing the relationship and I find it works so much better really to do virtual. And now I'm doing it worldwide, having a ball, uh, aside from the fact that I'm always losing my voice, which is, fun. <laughs> and I do classes now virtually mm -hmm. and we've created this little community because so much, it's just understanding the principles, just like I explained to you. And it's changing the, your brain, the way you're thinking about it, so that you can modify your behavior for your dog. Mm -hmm. And dog training doesn't have to be elaborate. If it excites you, do that. But you don't need to have champion championship ribbons. You just need to make sure your dog's not going to bite your kids and doesn't tear your house up when you leave. I mean, that's, you know, as a parent, I'm like, if I can hit that bar, we're doing good. Like if I right. train my dog, they come when they're called, they uh -huh. are okay when I leave them. I got two kids to raise and a life to run and I have work and that's all I need. And, and that they feel safe, they feel happy. I always say if you feel that you could come back as your dog, then you're doing a good enough job. <laughs> you don't have to do um, canine sports. Or, or daily three mile hikes to have a happy pet. You need to have a pet that can self soothe, that can rest when life throws them a curveball. Sleep training to me is more important than high exercise. Over exercise creates an athlete that mm -hmm. you're then beholden to. Mm -hmm. And I have three big dogs, you know, I'm sure they love a six mile hike every day. Some days they play in the backyard. Other days, they do get a hike. Other days, they get to walk around the block. It's with kids, it's, it's a juggle. Oh, yeah, yeah. I tell everybody, so I imprint puppies where they'll get shipped to the breeder and then I ship them home. The one thing I do and everyone's like, oh, how many commands do they know? Do they walk on a leash? I'm like, they are eight week old puppies. What they know is that when they go in their crate, they're gonna take a nap. What they know is that at seven o'clock, when I bring them on my lap and I do my self-soothing, they calm down, they might have a bone, and then at 7.30, they go in their nap. I'll take them out at 10 to do like a pee, 
And then I don't address until seven. So dogs need, when they're little and their body is developing, you know this, same with kids, their brain is developing. They need REM sleep. They don't need to sleep on the couch with the kids hopping off, you know, playing PlayStation. They need REM sleep. And if you can sleep train a puppy until six months, the rest is a cakewalk. Hmm. Training needs to be, if you want this, you will sit for it. If you come to me, I will give you a reward. I will pay attention to you. They need to learn words, but remember, Donnie, and I'll leave you with this, they are learning words as a second language. Their language is posture. So I'll leave you with this example. It's so fascinating. If I look at you and I say, Ibiza, Ibiza, super friendly, smiling, staring at you. I could say Ibiza from now until midnight. You wouldn't know what it meant because it's not your first language gibberish isn't. But if I said Ibiza and I handed you a cup of tea and then you reach for your cup and I said Ibiza, you would get in your head that Ibiza had something to do with this cup of tea right. or a cup. And you would, you would generalize and figure that out because you're smart and you're thinking and you want to feel connected. Same with dogs. They want to learn outside, get busy. If we calmly, routinely, when they're little, pair words to actions, words, bone becomes this thing I give you, ball becomes this thing I roll. They will parallel it, especially when they're little, and then they feel safe and connected. Mm -hmm. And then you can help them avoid anxiety when they're bigger. So what I do when people call me for training is I might just do one session if we're focused like on a problem, housebreaking or um, isolation distress or chewing issues, or I might do four lessons where they're sending me virtual evidence. They're getting assignments. My class is eight weeks and everybody sends me virtual assignments. And then, you know, we're working with the webcam. So I might have a puppy or one of my dogs while they're working with their dog. And I, and I coach and I, you know, critique and tweak. And every, every digital lesson I do comes with sending two to four videos for me to analyze and comment on during the week. So I'm really focused on human training and it's just mm. explosive how amazingly effective it is. And no, I mean, it's perfect. Cause people do ask me for like potty training tips or whatnot, like how we potty train Bella. And I don't know if you got to see that video, but I'm like, you want to start taking them out. This is just my personal experience, but take them out pretty much every hour. You're just learning their cues and they're like, Oh my gosh, I can't do that. And I'm like, no, you're just learning your dog's cues. You're not teaching your dog anything. You're right. just learning when they need to go potty. Yeah, well, we can do another one on potty training because I have an ebook that is now on my website, free. Um, when you go to my website, you get, uh, you'll get you have a library of ebooks and one of them is on potty training a puppy or potty training a rescue dog. And you get one ebook for free and it's like 30 yeah. pages on potty training. I'm happy to share that with you. Yeah, I can put that in the show notes. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. I think it's gonna help a lot of people especially with the pandemic going on and, you know, separation, anxiety, and isolation would actually be on the rise at this point. So thanks so much for coming on. I'm so happy. I'm so glad I got to meet you again. Thanks to the pandemic, we begin to meet more people in various ways. Thank you so much for watching today's show. Once again, check out the show notes because there's timestamps so you can go back and rewatch some of those tips if you need to. Also, if you wanna check out any of Sarah's trainings, once again, she has trainings online. She has a website that's full of great resources. Those are all gonna be in the show notes below so you can get in contact with her. Or if you wanna check out that special test that she mentioned to see if your dog does have separation anxiety, that quiz can be found below. Question of the day, what tip or step that Sarah mentioned stood out to you the most? Put in the comments below to start a discussion. I'm curious to see what you guys have to say. If you love learning about Boston Terriers, be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel just so you can get the latest from us. If you want to check out our latest video, you can check it out here or another video here. Otherwise, until next time, life is better with Boston.